goody, here it comes. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. <laughs> oh my God, don't stop now! With your hosts, Brian, John, and Elaine. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show, the madhouse for film freaks and film fans of all types. I'm your host, Brian Connington, joined by my fellow co-host and filmmaker, John Woolscroft. And if anybody's watching this on video, on the you can see that we are not alone. No, we're not. We are joined by filmmaker, DJ, and vice president of the George A. Romero Foundation, correct? That's right. Tina Romero. Tina Romero, welcome to our little humble podcast. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes. Um, so I like to ask this of all interviews. And some people, they jump right into it without hesitation. Other people are like, they get surprised. By but the uh, first thing I like to ask is just as an icebreaker is, can you tell us about yourself? Oh, yeah. well, let's see. I'm, um, I like to call myself a tough softy. <laughs> Soft. I like that. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. I like that. I like that too. Um, yes, I, I. You know, I am. I was a kid raised on '80s Disney movies. Um, I would be watching Pippi Longstocking and Bye Bye Birdie in my room at night, and then tiptoe past a horrifying movie poster on the wall. Uh, <laughs> I sat on a zombie's lap before I ever met a mall Santa. Um, I did my cameo in the dark half, and then went to Nutcracker rehearsal. I've, my world growing up was always a very bizarre mashup of dark and light. And nice. I really think that that defines me as a person and an artist. And I'm an edgy cheese ball. An edgy <laughs> cheese ball. <laughs> and, and tough, softy, edgy cheese ball. And what, what was that like at school? You know, um, uh, some kids' dads are firemen, some, you know, are architect. Your dad is, is a world renowned, famous horror director and just director. Bur just, birth yeah. zombies. Like, yeah. like, it's like, <laughs> Well, what's Bring our, your dad to yeah. school day. It's like, well, did your dad birth zombies? I don't think so. <laughs> you know what my dad did do uh, is he did come to my third grade class on Halloween and he um, he made the most epic like haunted house thing where we all pulled strings and like got got a little prize out of it. My dad was a very hands on creative, always yeah. doing projects type of thing. And he was, you know, he was. Yes, he was the zombie guy, but he was so not that guy. At I all. heard he wore a cape at one time. When I was talking to oh, John yeah. Russo and Russ Streiner, oh, they yeah, told they love me they're story. like, he wore a cape. Yes. That's I, all you got to know. That's, that's all you got to know. Yeah, my, <laughs> yeah he, you know, my, my dad was not a fashionista, but he, he could enjoy a good costume. In fact, one of my earliest Halloween traumas was, I, th I, I was... <laughs> Halloween uh, traumas. <laughs> was I maybe was like three. I have a picture of this, but he, I was little red riding hood. My mom was, was the grandma and my dad was the wolf and the wolf mask just did me in. Yeah. It was too much for me to handle. And I, I just begged him to please take it off the whole time. But he, he was, he liked to dress up. He, he, you know, he liked a little, he liked a fantasy. Nice. Well, you told a story yesterday uh, yeah. when you were introducing uh, Night of the Living Dead because we had a, here at the Erie Horror Fest like a huge orchestra. Like it was like seeing it new. Um, about your dad did something uh, kind of special with Santa Claus's wallet. Oh uh, yeah, you, you want me to tell you want me to tell that story? Yes, yeah. please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love to tell this story because you know people people often ask me, "Are you a little fucked up?" Because your dad made zombie movies, and while it's true <laughs> that I did see some shit yeah. at a young age. Um, <laughs> I always say, you know, no, but what might have done the damage was Christmas because my dad was the best Santa Claus that's ever existed. He was, you know, Santa always had some kind of trial or tribulation. There was a story to what was going on. Maybe he couldn't get in the chimney. Maybe he left his keys to his sled. And one year, Santa left his wallet behind which, you know, really sucked for Santa, but was very fun for us to find. And inside the <laughs> wallet was currency from all over the world, a Long John Silver's senior citizens card, stamps, pictures of me and Martha in Leningrad 91, Dasher on his 100th birthday. There was an international driver's permit made out to Centario Claus. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I still have this wallet. It's a, one of my most prized possessions. But, you know, what... What I say about this moment is it's like it's in the details. You know, this really this really kept me believing in Santa for a very long time. Now, my brother, on the other hand, who's a lot younger than me, was 
at five, he was like, I don't know about this Santa shit. And, <laughs> and, and my dad said, well, fine, what do you want to do about it? They rigged a camera at the top of the staircase. My dad had his friend Jason come in in a Santa suit, pillow under the Santa suit, whole thing, put the presents under the tree. And then he rigged a lighting outside the window to make it look like a silhouette of a sleigh taking off. And the next morning, wow. we, yeah, the next morning we, you know, to my, my mother's rolling her eyes the whole time, like, oh my God, you're really going to give these children a complex, George. Uh, but, <laughs> the, you know, the next morning we watch it in real time and my brother's like, okay, I'm not going to argue with this. I see. You know, for another few years, he I believed it. I was going to say, most parents would be like, well, then I guess you don't get presents then. <laughs> yeah. There's no Santa. But like, your dad's just like, listen, I am going to milk this Santa thing as much as I can because it's, it's fantasy. And, it's, and that's it's your dad. Exactly. Yeah. And, it's, and, I, and I think he really had fun with it. And, and I love talking about this because it speaks to the other side of George Romero, which is, you know, he's not, he was not all all blood and guts and horror. You know, he actually was such a gentle giant who loved Disney and loved going to Disney World and and would be and who who showed me how he was such a lover of cinema and he would watch his the films that he loved over and over and over again and he would opening notes of the West Side Story overture, he would be weeping openly in front of me and he really showed me how like it's okay to be moved by film. You know, he was just such a uh, feeler. It's it's good you bring that up because I do want to talk about your own films. Oh. Because I did watch it. Who, me? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, getting into film yourself. Did you always want to go into that or was it more like because you were like, you know, born into it and, and you were surrounded by, you know, yeah. people who, who work with your dad and that sort of thing? Did you just feel like, oh, well, that's kind of the family business? And acting as a small child, too. I, did, that, did that have any effect on anything? Well, you yeah. know, I think, I, I think 100% what I love, I thank you for, you know, even looking me up because I am more, I am Tina Romero, like yeah. more than just George yeah. Romero, and I have my own person, and I am a very different type of artist than he was, but I'm a certainly, certainly influenced by him and growing up around it no yeah. question and and it is a family business you know people often don't question doctors who are kids of doctors right. lawyers who are kids of lawyers and it, but in the hollywood you're a nepo baby yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> and as as you know that that's that's what that is what it is but i i think a hundred percent how could you not fall in love with filmmaking when you get to be on set and hear a rolling bell and see the magic that goes on in the community that goes on. And like, right. yes, they were gory sets and there were some crazy visuals, but it was never scary to me because it, my dad ran a set like with such grace and such good vibes everywhere. You know, it was his family, his film family, mm -hmm. those people, the Pasquale Buba and, and you know, his Barbara. brother was my professor. Oh, Tony, uh, Tony, Tony, yes. Yes. Tony, Tom Savini, yeah. Barbara yeah. Anderson, John Harrison. Yeah. These are the people who came over to our house on holidays. Yeah. Like this was the family. And so the vibes on set were really comfy, really fun, really good. And, and, and also it's, I mean, some people don't like production. I think it is incredible. Like what else What's better than being on set? Uh, and so I that I, I, I'm the post guy, though. Oh, you're the post I, I, I agree with thing. you. Here's okay, the thing, yes. though. I will say this: yeah. I like being on set when I'm in charge. Yeah. That's sure. the difference. Okay. That's, but I do. But it is a, it is magic. At 100, percent it's magic. It's yeah. magic. It's yeah. really it's it's so fun. I mean, I I when I was in film school, I. Um, I worked on everybody's films because I just, I like it there. I like I like being on set more than I like being in post. Yeah. Like I, I want to be moving. I want to be solving problems. I like to be on my feet. I like to be active. I, I like the challenges that it brings. And, and I, I just, I, I love it. The, the bug bit me early. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, for sure. It, I, I just was like, Oh, this is what, this is what I want to do. And I knew that that's what I wanted yeah. to do. And my, my parents were like, Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want to? No. no, they didn't want you falling in the biz. Yeah. It's a tough industry. It is. It is. There is yeah. like you know. There's no stability. There's no security. There's no planning. Yeah. You. It's and I. You know. They, it's not. It's not easy. And it, it is sort of a constant juggling act of yeah. you know how. And and that's why I also yeah. DJ. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like it's not. I haven't quite quite figured out the equation of like finding 
financial security in the industry. That's, but that's it, everyone across it, the board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. well, Aaron, it, yeah, it's everyone across the board because, like, you know, we both do film video work on our own. You and, you, you know, it. it's something yeah. that took years to try to find some level sure. of financial stability. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, so let me ask you, what is your, your style as a director? Because from what I've heard, and, uh, you know, obviously it's not, you're not going to be just like your dad, you know, you're your own person, but um, that your father was always just open, like the PA could be like, hey, George, I got an idea. And he'd be like, <laughs> far out, what is it? You know, and that might end up in the movie, um, you know, and people like, I don't shameless name dropping, sorry, Adrian Barbeau, when I interviewed her, she was like, you know, George was the the best director to work for because he was just so open and so receptive to that. Um, is that something that that you uh, you bring to a set where, or do you kind of follow in your dad's footsteps or are you a little bit more like, it's my way or the highway kind of? <laughs> I, th I think I definitely take after my dad in that way. And, yeah. I, and I'll never forget that there was a moment. You know, so my dad had an interesting lapse in his career between dark half mm -hmm. and then the Toronto years. Mm -hmm. And I, so I was kind of coming of age in that time. And then I got to go to Toronto and be on set with him. And I, and it was really interesting to be a little bit older and, and starting to be like more, more sentient as a human and like yeah. understand <laughs> yeah. what was going on. And, yeah. and I remember really observing him um, specifically in the costume trailer. There was this moment when, you know, they, the two wardrobe designers asked him, like, okay, which one, what do you think, this or this? And he said, what do you think? And that was his answer back. And he was really, he was really collaborative, and he was really good at knowing, trusting his team and, mm -hmm. and wanting people's input and making them feel empowered. And I think that that is, that is, that is what I think of when I think of directing. And maybe yeah. that is because I, my dad was that guy, and I watched him do that. But that's, I feel like that is the, the thing about filmmaking is collaboration. It is relationships. It is managing your relationships with people. And it is trusting that the people you're working with know what they're doing. Right. And, like, and being curious and what, what their vision is, too. And then checking yourself and seeing, like, is this a line? align with what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I think like I, I think a big part of my style as a director is is the pre the pre pangs, like talking to people ahead of time and really making sure that we understand each other, we are aligned in visions right. and like we, you know, we everybody gets what's going on so that when you get to set, you can you can just have a quick back and forth understanding of what's going on. Yeah. That makes sense. So I, to, that was a long-winded way to say. No, no, thank I, you. I yeah. am not. I certainly yeah. am, am not a, a, a whip cracker yeah. in that way. <laughs> I, can you speak to what it's like to direct music videos? Because I feel like that's a completely different style than than feature or mm. short film. Um, how, how do you approach like shooting a, a music video? Hmm. I mean, I so my I I love dance. I have a background in dance. I I very very drawn to any movies that have a dance sequence in it. And so I think that's usually the heart of what, like where things start for me is what is like the feeling of the choreography, what is the feeling of the, 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 the movement of, and how is that going to match the music? And then from there you start to, I mean, it depends on what the, the song is. You know, the song has to come first. Yeah. And, right. and then what is from there? What is the world you want to create from there? What's so cool about music videos is that you're not tied to plot. You know, you can really create a story that's more aesthetic and you can sort of take people on an emotional ride that maybe doesn't have the same type of linear narrative that that a that a narrative film has to have. And I, and I love that. I, I really love non-traditional, non-linear I noticed that with one of your short films. Mm. I noticed that with uh, Little Girl Blue. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that it was, it had a narrative thread to it, but it was very experimental at points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It actually reminded me a lot of a Boy with the Red Balloon. Oh, cool. So it had kind of that vibe to it, but, um, and it felt very personal. Yeah. It felt very much just <laughs> like, you know, a, a daughter's message to her dad. Yeah. But, yeah, that, that is a personal one. I actually love that film. I, yeah. re I, I really, that, that film, um, that, that was my first film when I was in grad school. Uh, and, yeah, you know, when I was in when I was in undergrad, I was what I did this thesis that was a live performance uh, 
dance, just mostly dance. And it was the whole concept of it was like, how can I take the audience on an emotional journey that feels complete, but that doesn't have a traditional beginning, middle and end. Right. Like how can you create a, a feeling in the audience where you understand the emotional ride, but you're not necessarily needing all the traditional things like dialogue and play. And mm -hmm. I, I was young, I was in my twenties and, and I do really, I love traditional storytelling as well. And so what I'm trying to do moving forward is is fuse the two together. Right. You know, take the take the music videos sensibility that I love and fuse it with with traditional storytelling and the things that do ground people in a, watching a feature and enjoying it because yeah. they're both important. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about DJ. I'm a, is it tricks? It's tricks. Yeah, okay, good job. Good, good job. Good job. Good. Good. Because I, I noticed the sign. I was like, I hope I don't mispronounce it. But yeah, how how did that alter ego, that persona come about? Oh, well, okay. So I I started DJing uh, when I finished grad school because I really, I, I mean, I always have, I've had headphones glued to my ears right. since my first Walkman. I just couldn't, I, I can't live without music. It is, I'm obsessed with music. I need it. It's It's my biggest motivator. And, um, I just, I, I had a hunch I'd be good at it. So I taught myself and I, I got my first residency I mean, I started out doing my friends parties, holiday parties and whatnot. And then I, I got my first residency in a club and Trix was born right after the Pulse nightclub shooting okay. when I had oh, to play wow. that weekend. Yeah. And I felt really weird about it. I felt like it felt really strange to me that. We were, se we were out dancing and celebrating after this terrible thing happened. And I found myself at my favorite shop, which is called Ab Abracadabra uh, on 21st Street in New York City. It's an amazing costume shop. You all probably love it. It's probably. like the place for if you need, like, if you need, if you need, uh, you know, fake blood, they got, every they got it all. They got all of the We good used to have one of those in Pittsburgh. And, yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Was I, it the one near the Ikea? Yeah. 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 Sorry. And then sorry. they got rid of it. <laughs> yeah. They got rid of it? I yeah. did. Yeah. 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 They got rid of it. So <sighs> like now all well, we got a spotlight, which spotlight costumes is bad. Mm. Um, but like, Bummer. yeah, they, they got rid of it. Yeah. There was one in the strip too that was really good. I remember good. the one in the strip. That one was really good. And, and honestly, like. That one was like, really good. Yeah. It's all like the film a... people came there. Like whenever yes. there was a show in town, they would all go there to get. But that one, they got kicked out too. It's sad. Yenzers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So you well, were anyway, saying, I was at yes. Abracadabra yeah. and my and I just gravitated toward this bunny mask and I was for the party that I was doing was called Hot Rabbit. So I said, I'm gonna pick up this bunny mask. And I ended up wearing it that night. I was I felt the alter ego take over. Yeah. All of a sudden I was like behind this shield and I felt really it was one of the best sets I've ever played in my life. And in that moment, I also realized that we had to be out that weekend. We had to be dancing. We had to not let this event impact the queer community in a way that was going to like shut us down. It was actually really important that we went out and danced and celebrated and, and stayed out. Yeah. And, and it then tricks just stuck. It was, I, I said, this is, this is my new thing. I, I feel so, I feel so transported and, and so bold. And I, I, I just loved the way it felt. It's and, awesome. Cause like I, it, and I have a lot of friends in Pittsburgh who are burlesque and sideshow performers mm -hmm. and you probably know a couple of them. Um, <laughs> probably. Um, and, you know, I've always asked them, like, because they come up with their own alter egos yeah. when they're on stage. Yeah. And the common thing between all performers, whether it be DJ or something like Sideshow or Burlesque, is that they lose themselves yeah. in the character. Yeah. And they also use that character to kind of, like, help with their own things going on personally. Totally. You know? And I have a lot of friends who, you know, they battle depression and anxiety and, like, being on stage and doing that performance is almost like medicine. It's like Absolutely. A hundred percent. And, you know, RuPaul says um, the power that you have in drag is accessible to you out of drag. Yeah. And that's, that's the other, you know, that's the next level is learning how to take, take tricks and bring her into my everyday life. And, yeah. it, and it really is a costume, a mask. Like it can, it can help me get there. I am by nature shy so having a mask does make me feel a little bolder, makes me feel more comfortable. But embodying that character does stick with me, and I yeah. do take her with me sometimes. And when I get nervous, I can I can I can access her. And you know, I actually I talk about 
this was such a strange moment, but I, at my dad's funeral, I ended up putting on fake eyelashes and I, I, I almost don't even remember it. Yeah. It was like this weird impulse. And it was like, I think what I was doing is trying to channel tricks because I was so sad and I was right. so, I, I was just in complete survival mode that I, I was like, all right, we're putting it. And when I think back, I'm like, you, why did you put on fake eyelashes at your father's funeral? But it was like, I think it was me looking for strength. Right. That's completely understandable. But mm. uh, speaking of, of your dad here, uh, can you speak to being the, the vice president of the uh, George A. Romero Foundation? Oh, man, the GARF, the GARF is so the cool. <laughs> the GARF, the GARF. Uh, you know, we, it's, you know, Suzanne is at the helm of this ship, and she is um, really has so much going on. And it, it's October, so it is our fundraising month, and we are, we are really leaning into supporting upcoming writers, filmmakers, and, you know, the money that we're raising right now is we've got some great initiatives going on, Screams in a Box. We've got, uh, we just we just helped f finance uh, a short film out of Pittsburgh. Um, we've got this new podcast series, The Bloody Disgusting, and in, we're just, we really are growing as a foundation, um, and we've got such great advisors, such a great team, and we've got the archive, the official George Romero archive. We got to see it. Oh, yeah? Yes. We oh, went cool. in because um, yeah. we, we both went to grad school at Chatham University. And oh, cool. And we know a lot of those people. So, like, they – and I, I teach there still oh, every okay. once in a while. Um, and <laughs> we got to go and we got to, like, look through a lot of that archives. Oh, and, nice. like, we were blown away by it. Right. Um, j especially by, like, the Not Living Dead script. Yeah. That yeah. was right there. <laughs> we're just, like – Wow. There it is. And it's right there. And, it's right and there. Your dad's treatment for Resident Evil. <laughs> that was like, yeah. I'm like, why didn't we get that movie? I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was a heartbreaker for him, too. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you know, he was a prolific, prolific writer. And there were so many unproduced works there. So if you yeah. are a fan and you, you want to go. go read some stuff that you never even knew existed, go. Go check it out. You can even look it up online. Um, you know, if you look at the Hillman Library, look for the George Romero Archive. You can there's a there's a whole finding aid, and you can you can discover what's in there. There's some really if you are an aspiring writer, it's a great way to see different versions of scripts. You can see mm -hmm. early drafts of scripts. You can see his handwriting, his notes on them. Well, even like letters back and forth between like distributors and studios yep. of you yep. know just the just the filmmaking process, the stuff that yes. no one really likes to think about yeah that's all there and that's all there on top of that like i kind of freaked out um because i got to hold the todd browning dracula script that's oh there. yeah just cool. as it's yeah as a horror fan you're yeah. holding the todd browning dracula totally like, this is insane deal. yeah 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 all right before we yeah. Yeah, before we wrap up here is there um anything in particular that we can help get the word out on oh oh wow I mean, we'll try our best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, listen, I, I'm actually in the process of making my first feature. Um, it's called Queens of the Dead. It is a glam gore zom com. It is a zombie apocalypse through the lens of queer nightlife in, in uh, Bushwick, New York. Fantastic. And it is, it is really, you know, I've, I've, I feel a great, immense responsibility to take the torch from my dad and, and usher in this genre into 2023 2024 and of course like you know my perspective is a bit different than his i i would call it female queer and dancey uh but you know it's if um if you're listening to this watch out for the film if you're listening to this and and you want to invest in the film <laughs> let me know <laughs> Well, 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 let me know if you need any crew people. Uh, you need <laughs> editors, yeah. crew people, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, where can people find more information about you, about tricks? Mm, okay. Yeah. I am, you know, I am on uh, the the Instagram, which I have a love-hate relationship with. I love the fact with. that you call it the Instagram because <laughs> I always get made fun of because I call it the Instagram and the internets and the TikTok. It is yeah. that, though. It is yeah. those It is yeah. those things. and I, And, you know... Ugh, so I I am it's not my favorite. I think I think that the the death box is killing us all, but I am on it. Uh, <laughs> the death box. And and um you can find me at, at DJ underscore T R X. Fantastic. Well it's been a pleasure having yeah. you on, Tina. Oh you, yeah. thank um, you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, 
Yeah. Doubt your dad, doubt your work. Yeah. It's been great. I, yeah, I just wanted to say before we completely wrap everything up, your father was the reason that I wanted to be a filmmaker. Because I remember, you know, my dad's like, you should watch this movie. It's Night of the Living Dead. And I rented it and I didn't know anything. He's like, it was shot here in Pittsburgh. And I'm like, Aww. wait, a movie was shot in Pittsburgh? Wow. You know, and then Aww. like, I just fell in love with his work after that. And it was like, he's just, he's on my Mount Rushmore. And when I, you know, that that's, the reason that I wanted to be a filmmaker was guys like George Romero. I have goosebumps right now. Can you yeah. see? I have goosebumps. Yeah. It's, I, I really, that's so, it's so beautiful. And, you know, I, 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 I share that love with you and I, anybody who loves my dad, I, I'm instantly bonded with because you understand the magic of him and yeah. he really yeah. was, he was magic. And yeah. awesome. I know, can't wait to watch you carry on that, that uh, torch. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, John, where can I find you at on the internets? Uh, same thing, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you know, uh, all the uh, guys who are in their 30s. So I'm not on cool things like TikTok or anything, but, uh, but I'm on those. Well, we are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the show is. Uh, the show is. YouTube, uh, J-Dub's Video Nasty, so check that out. Yeah. And you yeah. find me at Brian Connington on the Twitter, or X, whatever the hell it's called now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually, it's Twitter. It's Twitter, wherever it is. Um, <laughs> at Psycho Show on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And of course, we are on the TikToks at Cinema Psycho Show. And be sure to come to our website, cinemapsychoshow.com forward slash follow to get any episode we have. It's where you can get, up, get a hold of us. And uh, we will see you next time. Cheers. Bye.